psalmist writes, Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him glorious praise. Good morning and welcome to worship. If this is your first time to worship with us, we are pleased and honored to have you here. Please fill out a visitor's card so we get a chance to know you a little bit better. Now, if you will stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. When will God's promise be fulfilled? When will we be saved? How will we know the signs to take place? What shall it be called? Please join in singing our opening hymn, Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's from page 88. We'll be singing the first, second, fourth, and sixth verses. Oh, no. 
The world says all is lost. God says all is loved. The darkness says the light is dying. The light says the fire is catching. Fear says cover your eyes and your ears. Hope says wait, watch, and listen. As we light our first Advent candle, Pray for the Holy Hope of God. Come now, O child of Mary. Come, Come now, now, O Prince of Hope.
And why does the church tradition always begin the season of Advent with dark passages like Luke 21? Now in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke, just prior to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, he gives a sermon like this. It's colored by the tradition of apocalyptic language. And church tradition always begins Advent here. But why do we initiate this time of year that celebrates Jesus' birth by focusing on a passage that comes in Scripture just before his death? Why is this a good way to begin Advent? To answer these questions, we want to start looking carefully at the passage itself. As is typical of basically all of Scripture's last things passages, Jesus in Luke 21 kind of freely mixes up all the events, all the images that will take place very shortly with words that seem to point farther into the future. In the first 24 verses of this chapter, Jesus speaks not only of wars and rumors of wars in the distant future, but also, more specifically, he talks about the fall of Jerusalem, which would take place in just another generation or so. And similar, similarly, in other verses, on the one hand, Jesus seems to be pointing forward to his own death within the week, and on the other hand, he talks about what looks like might be off in the future somewhere. Sometimes he just mixes those images. It's all jumbled together. If Jesus was trying to draw a neat and tidy timeline that we could turn into some kind of end time chart and then hang on a bulletin board somewhere, he really didn't do a very good job of it. But that's not what he was doing at all. He wasn't drawing a chart. That's not prevented many other people, though, from drawing charts, charts of their own. I've been presented with those kinds of charts ever since I was a kid. But one of the oddest words I've ever seen on television, and you may have seen him too, would bring in all of the news stories of the day, especially events connected with the Middle East and then he would comment on those news stories and then just bury his listeners in a barrage of biblical texts from Ezekiel or Daniel or Re Revelation. And each and every news story was a fulfillment of a biblical prophecy. But even the casual viewer of that show could see over time that the same passages were applied to dozens, maybe even hundreds of different events. And it all felt very strange. But it's not as though we Reformed folks don't believe prophecies are fulfilled. We do. It's just that we don't make the definition of fulfillment quite so narrow. We don't look at the various predictions Jesus made here and then insist each one is allowed to be fulfilled one and only one time in history. Jesus wasn't giving a countdown checklist of items that we tick off one at a time as they happen. Instead, first we know that Old Testament prophecy was originally intended for a specific ancient audience in a specific set of circumstances. And secondly, we know that prophecy was always intended to be open-ended and have multiple horizons of fulfillment. Some of the things Jesus talks about here may have happened many times in history already, and may repeat themselves many times in the future. There will be a lot of many apocalypses, lots of times that will fit the descriptions given in Luke 21. But in Luke 21, Jesus is doing more than just telling us that history will be rough. He's also trying to reassure us. And that's what we often miss in this text. Jesus wants us to know that despite wars and earthquakes and disasters of all kinds, the world still belongs to God. None of those dreadful things need to make us conclude that the gospel is false or Jesus is not Lord after all. God still holds history in God's own hands even though it often seems to us that history is very broken. And what's more, 
all appearances to the contrary, the whole thing is going to head the right direction. Jesus describes a lot of events, terrifying events, cosmic events, involving the moon and the stars. Even then, he tells the disciples that believers can hold their head up high and rejoice in the midst of it all. So Advent begins with this frank, honest assessment of history's perils, of the present moment's terrors, and of the future's all but certain calamities, because looking all of that square in the face is actually a good way to frame Advent and Christmas correctly. We wouldn't need Advent if the apocalyptic features of life mentioned in Luke 21 weren't already a reality. So let me suggest that we all try to do this exercise in the next four weeks. And I'm not going to suggest to you that we dispense with holding or attending holiday parties. And I'm not going to su suggest that we skip by Christmas trees or, or decking the halls with all kinds of greenery. Nor will I suggest that we dispense with giving gifts to our precious children. What I will suggest is this. When you have that quiet moment where you get to sit in the soft glow of your Christmas trees and lights and sip some hot chocolate some evening after dinner, when you see the twinkling of the decorations in your neighborhood, or you see the shimmering of a child's eyes as she opens a gift, when you enjoy the delicious food at a holiday party, and then at some point say to yourself that this is not a distraction from the br brutality of real life. All of this holiday ambiance is not a chance to forget the world's troubles for a little while. Instead, see those pockets of light and joy as nothing less than the only reminder you may have that there is a light, there is hope in this troubled world. The kingdom of God that, that is initiated in the birth of Jesus comes on our behalf to bring that light into the world. Remind yourself the darkness still swirls all around, but pre precisely because that's so, and not despite of it, we must recall that a light shines in the darkness. A light no darkness no apocalypse, no warfare, no falling of meteors, no holocaust can prevent from shining. Let your holiday lights shine this season, but never forget whose light it is that is why this raw world so badly needs it. Some of us are old enough to remember the Peanuts comic strip, right? A comic strip from many years ago places this whole issue into context. It features Peppermint Patty with her friend Marcy, who frequently calls Peppermint Patty Sir. Peppermint Patty's in great turmoil over something she heard about the imminent end of the world, and she asks Marcy in a trembling voice, what if the world ends tonight? And Marcy responds, I promise there will be a tomorrow, sir. In fact, it's already tomorrow in Australia. It's already tomorrow. This expresses a theological hope. The church father Tertullian put it this way, the kingdom of God is beginning to be at hand. The reward of life and the rejoicing of eternal salvation and the perpetual gladness and position lately lost of paradise are now coming with the passing away of the world, already heavenly things are taking the place of earthly. My prayer for you during this Advent is that you wait and watch intently for the appearance of the Christ child in your life. Look for it in hope, in spite of the danger that you may see around you in the world. Expect more than traditional images of a newborn child and sweet melodies and, and the mellow strains of the traditional hymns, as wonderful as those things can be, expect your life to be different because of Advent. Expre expect the brokenness in your faith to be healed. Expect to be part of a hopeful tomorrow, which is promised and will come. 
Expect more from worship this Advent. Of course, if you want more from worship, you have to come to worship. So come, and come ready to engage your whole self in the experience, in the music, in the Word of God read aloud to you. Find the excitement in the exchange of ideas. Find the beauty in the opportunities to pray together as a community. Expect more from worship, and expect more from your own response to worship. Let the experience open your mind to new ideas and, and your heart to new venues of service. Expect to find deeper peace and deeper joy. Expect to find a deeper love for the one whose birth we anticipate and celebrate. This Advent, live like you have faith in tomorrow. Think more about Jesus. Learn something new, Jesus said. Share more of yourself with others. Take the time to get to know someone better. Invite someone to have a cup of coffee with you. Renew an old acquaintance. You know someone you find difficult to love? Take a first step toward that very person. Hope, peace, joy, and love are worth the effort. Let our hope begin with this, that through Jesus we will experience new growth, hope, and joy Find it in the season, and always remember there is love and beauty and tenderness in this world. May that love and beauty and tenderness bring us to a depth of joy that we will never find in material wealth. Through the peace of Jesus Christ, may we live in faith. Find that the beauty here is a reflection of divine beauty. And may we experience hope that tenderness and kindness will outlast meanness and hatred, and that we as a community will put love above indifference. May we find the hope that justice for all will overcome selfishness and deceit. And as we approach this table today, remember that Christ is here with us in his feast. He has come again as he said he would, and he will keep coming time after time to feed and reassure his people and that makes this a very blessed season amen i invite you to stand with me and say what we believe using the words of the apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Lord to us, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From heaven he shall come to judge.
an outpouring of love with one another as we share that meal. It remembers what God has done for us, the greatest gift that we will receive. So come to this table and experience life fully in the light and the hope of Advent. Let us pray. God of love, may the cup we share and the bread we break bring us closer to you and to one another. May it fill us with a desire to serve and be for us nourishment for our calling. We thank you that every person is always welcome at your table, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we remember that on the night Jesus was handed over, he took a loaf of bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. As often as you eat this, eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, drink it in remembrance of me. And now taste and see that God is good.
Now go from this place to love and to serve one another in great joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.